My name is Joe Holmes, and um, I am the organizer of this event. I've been doing this for about five years now. Uh, I've been in real estate for uh, 40 plus years, and um, I like, I love teaching, and um, I do have my own brokerage, and I do hire agents if your agents here are interested. Um, before we go, I, I've got some masks. If anybody's uncomfortable with the crowd, please, if you want to wear a mask, I've got them up here for you. Um, I brought my crystal ball today because I'm going to do some predictions, and so I need a crystal ball. Uh, before I get started with that, I want to know who the youngest person is here because I got a hundred grand for you. Uh, Twenty-five and under. Fifteen. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Twenty-five and under still here. Twenty-five. Twenty-five. I'll hold you. Eighteen. Here you go. Ready? Hundred grand. That's for you. Okay. Welcome. I love to see young people. Um, like I said, I'm going to talk today about um, predictions, what's coming up in the future, mostly is what I'm going to talk about. And then I'm just going to open it up and you guys can ask whatever questions you'd like to ask of me. It doesn't have to be related to this. And then uh, after that, should give us plenty of time to network. You can talk to everybody that's here. You kind of heard everybody what they're doing and what they're not doing or whatever. Um, the first little thing I want to go into is an article from the Register. Uh, not too long ago, home prices smash record. So I, I have actually been in the area. My dad bought a house in 1961. And so I've been here since 1961. I was uh, eight years old at the time. Add real quick to see how old I am, but anyways. Um, so you can see that we smashed the record. Uh, it's 693,500. Uh, for example, I bought my house that I'm currently living in. In 1980, I paid $160,000 for the house. It's worth 1.4 now. So you can see how much it's gone up since that time. But it has also gone down three times in my lifetime. So there are cycles here in California. The cycles are very extreme. Okay, so like, you know, a little bit over 10 years ago, we had a really extreme cycle and it went down a lot. Um, so if you were an investor at that time, which I was, um, I kind of knew what was going on. I saw the writing on the wall and I stopped buying properties long before that happened. When the downturn hit, then I started to buy like crazy. So that's, if you're young, that's kind of really the thing that you should be expecting is the next downturn, if and when that comes. Let me see. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, so this is not unusual. I experienced the same thing in 1980. I know a lot of you weren't around in 1980, but does somebody remember who the president was back in 1980? Carter, exactly. And Carter spent four years in office. Um, and, and I, please, I, I don't want to try to get political. I have something else political, but don't, don't think of it as political. I'm trying to teach you, okay? Uh, Carter spent four years doing what I think this president is going to do. So that's why I bring that up, because there's going to be a parallel that I'm going to be talking about, um, and it's inflation. And when I bought my house, it was actually... Uh, 160 that I paid for it. By the time I moved into it, because I bought a brand new house that uh, the builder was building from the ground up, so it took about seven months for him to build it. By the time it was finished, it was worth 200,000. I could have literally just cashed out. The problem was that we were experiencing inflation. Uh, the first loan that I got on the property, I was paying 16%, okay? 16%. So when people tell me, like, you know, Joe, 3% is really high, 4% is really high. It's like, <laughs> really? <laughs> um, yes, it's 16% on 160,000, where if I had if I had to pay 16% on, you know, 1.4 million, that, that would like really be a lot of money. That, that'd be way too much money. Uh, so you have to kind of take things uh, in relative terms. So this guy, um, 
I don't know if you know him, his, his, uh, as soon as this opens up here. He's one of the, the local forecasters. He's got a crystal ball like I do. Um, come on. And um, he, he is like the head guy or the dean of Chapman College in uh, Orange. And every year he comes out with a prediction of, you know, where we're going in the economy. Yeah, look, at his, that's his picture. He kind of looks as old as I do. Um, the, these guys, you know, are, you know, they, they, they have the backing in that he's a college professor and all that stuff. He's got the education. But I can tell you that we all have crystal balls, okay? Um, if you can predict what's going on in the future, I don't know why you're sitting here because you can predict what's going on tomorrow. Uh, you can get some really good information and you can use that information like I did 10 years ago to benefit yourself in the long run. Um, but, you know, all this stuff is kind of voodoo ec economics is what I call it. So he's predicting uh, a 4.4% growth. Uh, I don't I don't know why uh, he's predicting that, but he's also predicting uh, a drop in the home prices. And let's see here. The average U.S. house price will will be just 2.8 percent next year from 2021 levels following 15 percent. OK, which is what's been happening. 15 percent. And even if it drops down to 2.8, I'm OK with that. I, that's not a problem. That's just more opportunities for, for me, uh, to look at um, you know buying stuff. Uh, do I think, do I think you know the market necessarily is is going to drop? Um, I I honestly don't see it. I really don't. I, I still don't see a lot of inventory coming into the market, and that's what's really going to drive prices. And then we're also going to talk about interest rates. That will affect it. But then I'll talk about how much it's going to affect it. Again, crystal ball, okay? Crystal ball. Uh, this is Realtor.com's forecast. Uh, so you can see 2021 um, existing home medium sales price was up 12%. They're predicting next year 2.9. Uh, is existing home sales, 6 million. Uh, they're predicting up 6.6 .6 million. That's a big jump. I don't know where they're getting that from. I really don't. Uh, existing homes for sale inventory is down 18%. Um, they're predicting it's going to be up just slightly, 0.3%. Again, I don't see it. I, I literally work this market every day as a real estate agent. I have 110 agents underneath me. I know exactly what's going on. Most of the time, uh, my agents or myself are putting properties on the market and they're selling in days, and they're selling over asking price. Um, the last agent sold one, um, started at a million, and it sold for 1.275, so 275,000, and they removed all the contingencies. No appraisal, no inspection, nothing. It's like, wow. And here we are, December, which is normally, for a real estate agent, I, I mean, I honestly, I used to go on vacation because it was so slow. There was nothing going on. But uh, this market's continued to be strong and continue to move forward. And I don't see properties coming on the market um, like maybe these predictions are, are talking about. Um, interest rates, average 3% to 3.2 this by the end of this year. Um, and then they're saying it average 3.3 to 3.6 by end of year. Uh, single family housing starts up 15%. And they're saying um, only going to be up 5% next year. Who knows? Maybe that's true. Uh, home ownership rate is, looks like it's the same, 65% versus 65%, 0 0.5, 0 0.8. Not much of a difference there for home ownership rate. So and now these are the... Uh, uh, smart people out there that uh, they do have a crystal ball, but um, crystal ball, crystal ball. Okay, now this this is the part where please don't kill the messenger. I want you just to listen to the message. 
So just because this person is who he is, please don't, uh, please don't, please don't listen to that. It ta it's about uh, 12 minutes long. Let me pause it there. Do we understand what he's talking about? Hopefully. Um, I experienced all this in the 1980s. This is, this is like I'm starting all over again and I, I get to read the playbook before anybody else does. At least that's how I'm experiencing it. Uh, used cars. Uh, there was a guy on YouTube the other day that had a really fancy car, two years old, bought it for, I think he said like 40,000. And he went to the dealer and he sold it to the dealer. Used car, two years old, sold it for, for 50,000. So he made 10,000 on a used car, which is like unheard of. I mean, that doesn't happen. Um, so these, what he's going to go through next are the actual real numbers of what's going on out there. And I'm sure you're experiencing the same thing. 21%, crude oil up 55%. Dimensional lumber, 35%. Crude oil. So what does he do? <laughs> okay, again, not to get into politics, just tell you where all this stuff's coming from. I love listening to these politicians talk because they give you insight as to what's coming in the future or what not. Okay, so if they're going to shut, uh, you know, the pipelines down and they want to go green and do all this stuff, you best best get yourself a Tesla uh, because I have a Tesla and I'm happy and I'm sorry for all of you who are paying five dollars a gallon or more for your gas, but um, I actually love it because most people can't afford it. And so it makes it easier for me to drive around because nobody else is driving around. OK, uh, but I guess that's being a little selfish, but it's, it's also being honest. OK, lumber, lumber does affect me because I rehab houses. Meat, 37%. Hey, who's who's getting hurt the most with inflation? Besides you, who who who, who is getting hurt the most? Who where, what what people on what economic scale are getting hurt the most? I'm sorry, I can't hear. Lower. Absolutely. Why? Because they can't afford anything. Here, you get one. You. Get one, too. It's 100, 100 grand for your flip project. Uh, so, yes, it's it's the lower income that, uh, you know, I, I, I can afford to go out. Um, I can afford to even buy a new car if I wanted to. Um, I can afford those things that, you know, I've worked for for the last 40 years. But inflation absolutely hurts the lower class. Uh, I mean, even just gas alone, when you go from $3 a gallon to $5 a gallon, you're hurting. Okay, so back in the 80s, there was a group of investors, myself included, that we would buy houses from builders in the first phase. They were building multi-phases, so four, five, six, seven phases. Properties under contract in January for 120. By the time the builder finished building it, because of this, it was worth 180. By the time I took possession, I took possession, I put it back on the market and I sold it. So I had that property for less than a month and I made $60,000 on it, okay? The builders today won't give you a contract to buy a house, they give you what's called a reservation. And they do that because of what happened in 1980. They don't want to get caught in the same position that they were back then. Okay, so there I know a lot of investors that literally were buying properties, and they this is this is their their calculation. Okay, so if I buy a property here in California, everybody knows I'm probably not going to cash flow. Okay, so how much am I going to be negative cash flow? So let's say I'm. $500 negative cash flow. But then I look at this inflation, I, I buy in January, I put a renter in there, I'm losing $500 a month, but by the time it, get, it comes to December, that property's worth 70, 80, $90,000 more. So you do that calculation, I'm losing 500 a month, I subtract that by the amount of money I, that I'm gonna make when I sell it next year, heck yeah, I'll buy that. Speculators. Okay, I'm not telling you to go out and speculate. I'm just telling you 
that, like he's saying, investors look for these type of things that are occurring and listen to these people talk and then try to take advantage of that situation. Right now, um, I've always flipped in Orange County. I still do, but my flip ratio to uh, Riverside and San Bernardino, which is the other areas he was talking about, I may flip two or three properties here in Orange County a year. I flip 70, 80 properties out in Riverside, San Bernardino, because I can buy into them for 200,000, fix them up for 100 or less, and sell them for 400. I can't do that here in Orange County. I'm, I'm having to buy properties for eight or 900,000, put 100,000 into it, and then maybe I'll make 100,000 at the end of the day. If I have to do that for, let's say, a million dollar property, I'd rather buy five properties out there in Riverside, San Bernardino, than just buy run property here in Orange County, okay? But that's because that's what's happening. That, that's where the flow is right now, is properties out there. And we've even started to go off farther. We're, we're heading out to the desert areas as well, Joshua Tree National Forest. Um, all that stuff is exploding because of Airbnb, where we have two properties that we're doing up in Big Bear that we're gonna turn into Airbnbs as well. But that, that's just an industry that that came to light, you know, or to life seven, eight years ago, about nine, somewhere around there. And in particular areas, it makes sense to do that. So that's where I would say, if you're gonna, you wanna cash flow in California, you need to go out to the desert or you need to go up to Big Bear, someplace that you can Airbnb your product uh, because you're really not gonna buy something here that cash flows. You're just gonna buy properties to- Anybody investing in cryptocurrency? Yes, here, here we go. <laughs> Sorry, here we go, here we go. I don't, and that's because of my age, I think. I'm like really wary of something that I can't touch. And that is like, everything's on the cloud. Um, like anything else, if you're an expert in the stock market and you're killing it, you probably shouldn't be in this meeting, okay? Why are you here if you're killing it in the stock market? I'm the opposite. I got, one of the reasons I got into real estate is because I did have some cash. Uh, I, back then we had professionals who managed your cash. And so I gave my money to a professional to manage and I would get statement after statement here, Joe, the $10,000 you gave me is now worth 9,500. <laughs> then the next month it's worth nine grand. And I'm on the phone the third month going, uh, what's going on? Oh, Joe, yeah, I'm sure you've heard this. The market goes up and the market goes down. We're just like doing a little down thing right now, but I've got you in some really good stocks. It's gonna go back up, 8,500, okay? And then I said, that's it, I'm done. I pulled my money out and then I just started investing in real estate. So if you're, if you're old enough to remember, the first downturn we had was a dot-com bubble and everybody kind of like this um, Bitcoin stuff. Everybody was throwing money at this, you know, if you had a business and it was like online on, on the internet, you were getting money thrown at you, okay? My son just graduated from college with a computer degree at the time and people were literally throwing money at him and they were giving him stock options, okay? And he was just like going crazy. I mean, there's one company that literally took him to a, a clothing store and said, you know, we're gonna buy you some nice suits. How many do you want, 10? Okay, bought him 10 suits because he needed the suits, okay? So anyway, if you, if you don't remember, we're up here and boom, it went down here. How much money did I lose? Zero. I'm not invested in the stock market. So everybody's crying and I'm like, sorry, you know, I'm actually doing really good because yeah, we're in the middle of inflation and all my properties are, you know, going up. During the time that I bought my first investment, which I still have back in uh, 1982, I believe it was somewhere around there. 
Um, I have never, never had to lower the rent that I charge my tenants, never. Rents, rents in California do not go down. Sorry, but they don't. Even when we had the downturn, why didn't they go down? Because all these people that were losing their homes were coming into the rental market. So that only did nothing but increase the rental prices. So I was raising my rents as these people were coming back in. And I was also helping them do short sales to get out of the mess that they were in. Okay. So um, I inflation is something serious to be uh, taken care of or to be aware of. 2008 is right when we had the crash and... I'm sure Jim's a smarter guy than I, but I predicted that that was going to happen. And um, I, I put my mouth where my money is and I was not representing buyers at the time. I refused to. I, I would be representing sellers. And so a seller would come up to me and they say, I've got a two bedroom house in Rancho Santa Margarita. I need to sell, Joe. How much do you think I can get for it? At the time, 500, 525, what? For a two bedroom house? Yeah, sell it, sell it. I'm, I can't tell you how many sellers I had that were so happy with me. But again, I did not represent buyers because I had a feeling this was coming. The downturn was coming. I've already experienced two of these. And I could tell with the economy the way it was, we had lenders out there that were giving 100% loans. We had lenders that were giving 110%. How does that work? Oh, we're just like betting on the future for you. We're betting that it's going to continue to go up. Okay. I want to give you a loan. Okay. And it's going to be 100%. And we're going to give you a really good rate, 3%, 4%. But it goes up in a year. You didn't hear that part, did you? It goes up in a year because it was unadjustable. So it went up to 10, 11% after that. So what the heck happened? Of course, anybody could predict predicted that. It's like, nobody can afford that. You know, it's like crazy. But they were predicting that it was going to continue to go up. Okay, their crystal ball said that it was going up. And it, I, I just saw it. It, it. You could not sustain it. And then when it hit, it was probably the quickest I've ever seen it. It, it just like from one, from one minute to the next, it happened. Um, I like investing in real estate because I can see kind of the market trends when it's going up and when it's coming down and it gives me time to adjust. But I'm telling you in 2008, it was so quick and everybody was panicked, just panicked. If you had a place, you were dumping it. If you were upside down, you were trying to get out of it for whatever reason, sell it for whatever you can. That's where we ended up with all the short sales. I love short sales. I learned something new. I learned how to handle short sales. I learned how to negotiate with the bank on how to do short sales. So we went from uh, the banks like getting caught with their you know pants down, okay, to where we are today. So um, I called it the Wild West. I had condos in San Juan Capistrano where I've been investing in uh, for over 40 years, and early 2008 they were selling for 450. By the end of 2008, they were selling for a hundred, so 450 to a hundred thousand, that quick. It's like mind blowing. Okay, so when he get back, got back down, I was representing the folks in the area who were lower income, who were enticed to come in to purchase these homes. Okay, with the hundred percent financing. So really, at the end of the day, they didn't have much money in it, so they really didn't care. And that's what I heard from all the people I was representing was, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know. Uh, Joe, how long can you drag this process along? Okay, because like we're not paying our mortgage. So if you can do this for like a year, we'd be happy with you. I said, well, I can't make any promises, but that's what, what it's taking right now. It's taking about a year for me to negotiate these deals. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. All the deals I was negotiating were all investors. I would not work with a normal buyer because the buyer um, you know, says, yeah, Joe, I wanna buy this. And then she's gonna go 
to you um, who is a real estate agent and you're going to find her something else. So now I've lost that buyer and I have to start the process all over again. So I would only work with investors who had the cash and could sit there and wait. And they did. Believe me, I've got lots of people that I uh, purchased properties uh, with and helped them out. Wild West, I'd send the bank an offer for a hundred grand and they say, when can you close? That's it. Nothing else. We don't need any of this. We don't need any of that. Then as it progressed, then they wanted paperwork from the borrower to make sure that they were kind of solvent. I mean, not solvent, insolvent. Okay. Uh, then, they, then they required, as, as it kept going along, then they required their, they put their systems in place. Now they required an appraisal on the property. Okay. Because they didn't trust the real estate agents anymore that they were selling them for the right price. Okay, um, they, they were, I mean, there were some crazy banks, uh, Chase in particular, uh, Chase was uh, sued for doing fraudulent loans and uh, a part of their, their penance was to give money back to the homeowner. Well, this is the homeowner that bought it for no money down and they're literally at, at the end of escrow getting a check for $30,000. And I, I, I'd have my clients call me, the sellers, Joe, is this right? I get 30,000 from the bank? I go, yeah, just take it, go cash it and have a nice life, okay? That's kind of the rules that we had at that time. So now we're at the point where um, if you have an REO real estate owned, which is bank owned property out there, nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, they're listed at what the market is right now. So you're not really getting any deals on any of those. So I can save you some time. Don't look for any REOs because here in California, you're not you're not going to find any deals whatsoever. Um, I don't know what happened to Jim, but uh, obviously he didn't predict what I, I saw. The point of that. Again, not the messenger, but the message and. My my. You know, my take out of that is if you own property, uh, you're sitting in good shape. You know, if you don't, I suggest you start looking whether it's going to be your own family residence that you're buying or um, properties that you're going to either buy and hold or flip. Okay, so one of the guys that was mentioned earlier, uh, Jerome Powell, he's the uh, in charge of the Federal Reserve. So he's, he's came out the other day and said that he is going to bump up the interest rates by a quarter of a percent, three times next year. Understand we're probably around three and a quarter now. So that would put us around 4%. Um, not good for real estate, uh, but then again, not tremendously bad. If, if I've always said, if we get over five or 6% interest rate, that's when we're really going to feel it. That's when we're going to have another downturn. Uh, but him going up, uh, you know, to three and three quarters or four, uh, it's going to hurt, but it's not it's not the end of the world. OK, um, I, I don't know that necessarily if, if I was looking for a house to buy that I would probably wait on that right now. Um, if you're flipping, it's a totally different animal. Flip business is, is really just a numbers game. Um, if, if I can flip a property in three to four months, uh, which I know that the market's not gonna turn that quickly, and I know I can get this price at the end of the day, then I just flip it, okay? And so if we have another downturn like we did before, okay, instead of buying you know one property at a million, if, if we go back down to, 250,000, I'll just buy four or five at that, at that price. And I'll continue to flip in that type of market. The only difference is when it gets down that low, then uh, buy and holds become attractive. So for all of you who are young, especially 18 back there, if we get to that point, I am telling you, try to hoard as much cash as you have right now and buy as much as you can and literally hold on to it for the rest of your life. Don't look back, just keep looking forward, lease out the property. When you get to be my age, then you have a decision to make, okay? 
Do I start cashing in what I have and pay taxes, which I don't want to do? Or do I pass it along to my children? Okay, which that means I, I end up not being here anymore, you know? So that's also not good for me. But um, I'm happily cash flowing on my properties that I've purchased over the last 40 years, okay? And my tenants have sometimes gladly, sometimes not gladly paid for it, but um, they have. So keep an eye on the Fed and what they're doing because that is really important. That's one of the, the, the pillars. So we have interest rates. We have uh, jobs that you have to keep an eye on. So if people start losing their jobs for whatever reason, if they start losing their jobs, they can't make their mortgage payment. So that's going to hurt the economy as well. And what do they do? They stop making their mortgage payment because that's probably one of the biggest, biggest expenses that you have. And so then that's going to start. If you see those two together, then you know that we're really in trouble. The third leg of this three leg stool that I'm talking about is banks. So if the banks start getting crazy and they start getting crazy and listen to me, they start getting crazy as the interest rates go up. OK, banks are in the business of loaning money. If they don't loan money, they don't make money. If you take out a mortgage for 300,000 in 30 years, you pay that off. How much have you paid? How much? Close. Close. Yeah, it's about double. You already have one. You went to her. You already have one. Here. You have one? Oh, yeah, you do. No, you don't. Here. Catch it. Thank you for trying. So the banks. They're in the, they're in the uh, game to make money over the long haul, okay? That's why they don't like working with investors because if you buy a property and then sell it three months down the road, they put too much time and effort into qualifying you for that loan and they're going to say next time you come to them, yeah, no, we don't do that. Okay, go find a hard money lender. Okay, and that's why hard money lenders are out there because they can do the short-term stuff because they charge you more interest rate and more points up front. OK, so um, beware of the three legs that I just talked about. If you start seeing those erode, um, especially if the banks. Especially if the banks start getting crazy because the interest rates go up. And so now, OK, this is what they do. So our minimum to loan on FICO scores. Everybody knows what FICO score is, right? Yes. OK, your credit score. If if uh, if the minimum right now is, you know, like 680. Uh, yeah, let's lower it down to 650. Why? Because we can get more people in at 650. OK, so when you see when you start to see crazy things like that, please beware that um, we're headed towards a downturn. OK. Uh, so here we are in Orange County. Home price, 900000 you're putting 20% down. The interest rate today is 3.24. Your mortgage payment is $31.29 a month, okay? Let's say we go up to 4% because he's talking three rate hikes, so we're, we're getting close to 4%. So let's go up to 4%. And remember, 3129 monthly payment, 3537 is that a lot? Four hundred dollars a month? Is that going to? It's four point two four. Yeah, four point two four. We're at three point two four now. So if we go up one percent, yeah, we're at three five three nine. So would that throw somebody out of the market at four hundred dollars more a month? Yes. No. Maybe so. Huh? No. Okay. So let's. But let's say it does. So let's say we want to keep the same payment. We'd have to reduce that price, home price, to eight hundred thousand to bring that payment back down to thirty-one forty-four, which is where we were. So your buying power is lost there. Even one percent, you're losing um, buying power. Okay, so that this is what uh, interest rate hikes do, and it's they do it on purpose to slow down the economy, and 
bring us back to a normal economy. But sometimes these guys go overboard and they continue to raise interest rates or other things are happening in the economy that they have to even slow it more. And so then we jump, you know, higher. We, we go up to, you know, five and a half or whatever. If, if we were to go back up to 900,000 and we went to five and a half now, 5.24, sorry, five and a quarter. So we went from 3,100 to 3,900. That's a big deal. That's $800 a month. That's that's going to get you thinking <laughs> if, if, I, if you want to buy the house or not, or you can even afford it. So. Any questions? Don't all ask at once. Does any does anybody have a crystal ball? They, they want to predict something? Yes. Okay, so I think I think I understand your question. So here's 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 my answer. If you're looking to stay in Orange County for a long period of time, the average the average homeowner stays in their house anywhere between five and seven years. Okay, you need to be kind of like me. I've been in my house for over forty two years. Okay. The, what I would what I would say to a client is if you're going to buy a house to live in now, you're going to buy it, number one, because it's three and a quarter percent interest. You're going to lock that in for 30 years. And then hopefully this is for your forever home. You're going to love it here. You're not going to move anyplace else and you're going to stay there. No matter if the interest rate goes up or down, you really don't care. You're in there because you can afford that payment. You've got a good job. You're not likely uh, to be laid off or let go for any reason. Okay, so you have to put all that into play. I think what you're trying to talk about is, should I do that thinking that I'm going to move in five or six years or whatever? The problem is now you're trying to time the market. And again, if you have a crystal ball, excuse me, if you have a crystal ball and you know when you can do that, then please do it but you probably don't. And I can't tell you because even my crystal ball, look, one of the lights is broken. So like I'm walking around like this, you know? So um, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, if you're gonna think long-term, then think long-term, 30 years. If you're gonna think short-term, then you really, put a, you really should put a lot of thinking into that. Okay. Yes. So, so interest rates, jobs, and the banks getting crazy, giving out free loans. Because they, I'm telling you, they will. If the minute the interest rates go up, okay, you're going to see we've lowered our FICO score. We've opened it, and they do, do, you know, they're salespeople. We've opened it up to the economy because we want to take care of this set of people that maybe can't afford a house. So we want them to come into the market. So we've lowered the uh, FICO score down to 650. It's just a marketing ploy. They're already uh, providing so different types of loans, uh, much more better than this. Like 10 years ago, okay? Again, remember I went through three of these cycles and they were all different. 10 years ago, the banks got so crazy. They were, uh, beforehand, they were lending out these loans and 10 years before that, most of the loans that were being sold were FHA or VA. Um, conventional was just starting to come out, not a lot, but they, boy, they brought it out like gangbusters, conventional loan. Well, what you don't know, the difference between conventional and VA and FHA, VA and FHA, those are loans that are um, 
funded by the banks, but they're guaranteed by the federal government. So the banks are going, oh, okay, yeah, we can loan all this money because we know we're not going to lose it. Okay, so if somebody, you know, backs out of an FHA or VA loan, they stop making their payment, we have to foreclose. The bank says, oh, here, they foreclosed, send us our money, and the government would send them their money. Well, 10 years ago, before, you know, this last bubble, they were doing just conventional loans. And who was on the hook? All these hedge funds and stuff were on the hook for this stuff, not the federal government. So when we had the downturn, who was, who was you know, losing money? Was the banks left and right? Was the hedge funds left and right? And then here comes the bank. I'm sorry, here comes the government. Oh, gosh, we don't want you to lose any money. We're going to prop you up, you know, and all these guys over here that did all this stuff. Yeah, we're not even going to prosecute you for any of this stuff that you did. We're going to make you whole again because we need you. That's what happened. OK, this time too big to fail. So this time we have a very good base of loans. They, they can be conventional, but they're making people put 20% down. They're making put in investors. If you bought a property like a second home or something, you were putting 25% down. So there's plenty of equity there. And, and I keep hearing we're going to have this mass of people that are going to get foreclosed on because of this COVID stuff and uh, mortgage forbearance, and now we're off of mortgage forbearance, we're gonna have this tidal wave of people getting foreclosed on. Don't listen to them, okay? If I bought my house even two or three years ago for 500,000, it's probably worth 750 now. So how am I gonna get foreclosed? There's $250,000 equity. I'll give it to a real estate agent to sell before that happens. Yes, I'm going to have to move because I can't afford it anymore. I'm going to be a renter, but I'm not going to get foreclosed on. I'm not upside down on that property. So you're not going to see the massive, you know, foreclosures that I see people, uh, um, you know, saying that it's coming. It's coming. Sorry. I'm sorry to tell you, but it's not coming. OK, it's not coming. And if anything, you get what we're getting is is panicked people in that situation that uh, for example, I bought um, a foreclosure six, seven months ago, and he was literally three or four days away from getting foreclosed on, but he had equity. So I bought him out of his equity. OK, that's what's exactly what's going to happen. It, these, you know, they're, they're not going to let their houses go to foreclosure and lose all that money. OK, so if you're not a real estate agent, please don't answer this question. When you get foreclosed on, if you have a property and you get foreclosed on by the bank, okay, somebody at the courthouse steps buys it for five hundred thousand, knowing at the end of the day it's probably worth six hundred fifty, seven hundred thousand. The loan that they purchased was four hundred thousand. So. The investor, like me, paid five hundred thousand, but the bank loan was four hundred thousand. There's a hundred thousand dollar spread there. Who gets that money? Huh? The owner. Is everybody aware of that? Does anybody want to question that? Huh? It's their equity. Okay, so why do they get the money? Well, people think that once you get foreclosed on, the bank gets it all. That's not the case. That's not true. Okay, so next question. How do they get the money? You're not a real estate agent. Answer this question. How do they get the money? Okay, in the process, the banks hire a, a trustee to sell the loan for them, okay, because that's what they're selling, a piece of paper, okay. The trustee gets all the proceeds, and he adds up all the numbers, and then he has $100,000 extra sitting in his trust account. 
how do we get this money back to the owner? If the owner even knows. Okay, so nine times out of ten, the owner has no clue. They think what normal people think is, I've lost everything. Okay, when in fact that's not the case. It is as simple as contacting the trustee in that property and claiming your money. It is really that simple. Okay, but I'm telling you, nine times out of ten, that does not happen. There's actually companies that are still in existence that were formed to inform the seller. Okay, so the bank's not going to call you and tell you after they foreclose on you, they don't care. Okay, so they're not going to call you. The trustee is not his responsibility to call the seller and say, hey, by the way, I've got 100000 sitting in here. Okay, they may send a letter, but they don't. So there's companies out there that you get this information, okay, from public information from, from uh, uh, the recordings of these properties. And so then they call you and they go, hey, Leo, my name is Joe, and I work for Get Your Money Back for Free. How would you like to get, uh, you know, how would you like to get uh, 50000 of your $100,000 back? How's that sound? You can get me $50,000 back? Yeah. You know, you just signed this. Uh, you're actually owed a hundred, but that's my commission. $50,000, yeah. Yeah, I'm telling you the truth. I can tell you the guys that are doing this, okay? How'd you like 50,000? Leo goes, 50,000, where'd that come from? You know, out of the blue, heck yeah. What do you want me to sign? I'll sign here. So he puts him in touch with the trustee through your attorney, because your attorney has to get paid too. Puts him in touch with your, with your attorney. Hi, have a seat. And um, you, at the end of the day, get your 50000 but then so do I. Okay? Yes, there are people out there that do these things. Uh, the point is, there's so many different ways to make money in real estate that you really kind of have no clue <laughs> until you start uh, uh, coming to meetings like this, talking to me, investigating, whatever it is that you're looking to do. Any other questions? I think there was some more, wasn't there? Yes. When do you see the market changing to a buyer's market? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, if we get over 5% interest, I, I see it changing to a buyer's market. Um, but like I said, 1% or, you know, three basis points, 0.75 percent next year is is not going to affect the market that we're in right now at all. Yeah, I don't I don't see it. Yes. So if, uh, let's say an investor carries a note on a property for 500 days and then forecloses it and it's worth around 700, would the investor get the spread or would the property? No, you're just like the bank. You're, you're only allowed to collect what is owed to you. So you can collect the 500,000, you can collect whatever attorney's fees it took you to get that money, anything else, you can add that in there, but you cannot make a profit on it. How about interest? interest, yes, you can get interest, whatever's owed to that date, you can get. But you can't get, like I said, if somebody has a note for 500,000 and somebody bids 600, you're not gonna get the extra 100, that belongs to the owner, okay? so. One more thing along those lines. So if the owner never finds out and nobody tells them, that money literally stays in the trust account of the trustee that the bank hired for five years. And then it goes where? State. I heard it over here. State. <laughs> the government gets everything at the end of the day. They really do. And I got like a lot of hundred thousands left. So I got to start. Did you have one yet? No, you don't. You don't. I mean, you guys are so, the young, young generation, it's like they're healthy. You're like healthy nut, right? Something, not a nut, but healthy. Yeah. Like I still go to Carl's Jr. Come on, you know? Yes. Um, any other questions? Yes.
Yeah. Yeah, it's actually less risky to the bank, but again, that's where they're headed. They want to get more people into the housing market. So then they raise the FHA rate, which you remember I said was guaranteed to the bank. So if you rate, and especially in this area, because we're in a high cost area. So I think that's being raised to like, somebody knows, like nine something, 980. Yeah. Is that what you said? Nine what? Nine, 970. Do you have one? Here, but over only, your head. But only like Yeah, I'm tossing good. Yes, correct. Certain areas in Orange County, it's a high cost area, so it's it's 980. But if you were to go out, um, yeah. you know, San Bernardino or something, it may be way less than that. Yes, yes. Again, but that's that's the government telling the banks bring more people in to this affordability. Uh, even though the market, you know, because the more people you bring in, the more it's going to go up. So what does bring that mean them in. When, like, the government's taking on more risk, right? Because, like, FHA is literally not the same more insurance, but, like, it's, I don't know, it's safer to say that you because there's not as much equity there. Like, okay, we are talking to government here, okay? <laughs> so it's like they don't care about risk. They have a printing machine. If I had a printing machine at home, I wouldn't care about anything either, okay? The problem is that that printing machine is going to, you know, come due one day. I'm not gonna pay for it because I don't think I'm gonna be around that long, but maybe you or your children at the end of the day are absolutely gonna pay for it because they lend out this money uh, right now, I think China is probably the biggest buyer of bonds in, in, uh, in the U.S. What do you think? China is going to wake up one day and say, eh, don't worry about that money we lent you. It's OK. You don't have to pay us back. Hell no. You know, they're going to say, yeah, remember? Yeah, it's time. You, you need to pay us back. So the government, the government, the government right now is is um, trying to pick which they shouldn't do, but they're trying to pick favorites. Uh, let me give you another example, and nothing to do with real estate. Electric cars, okay? Who's the largest electric car company in the world right now? Yeah, you keep answering. Here, I'll give you one. Tesla, okay? So they have a summit in Washington, and they say, bring all the EV makers in. Who do they not invite? Tesla. Tesla. Why don't they invite them? Elon's got a big mouth. No. Why, why did they not invite Tesla? What? Because Tesla's already sold all their, I mean, I know they've reached their cap. No, 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 no. No, no, I haven't heard it yet. No, I haven't heard it yet. Uh, there we go. Say it loud. Their factory is not unionized. Okay, so this Build Back Better bill, which thank God got defeated, one of the provisions in there was we were going to start giving credits to EV owners again because we want everybody to have an EV, right? And if you buy an EV from Tesla, you get 10,000. But if you buy an EV from Ford or GM, you get 15,000 because they have a union shop. Tell me that's not trying to pick favorites. It has nothing to do with Tesla being literally the best car out there. I'm, I'm biased because I have one, but literally the best car out there, okay, right? You know it. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with unions and they give a lot of money to people, especially Biden over the years. I heard a really good joke the other day. So, you know, Biden's been in office forever, okay? And how these people get these jobs that are, you know, like right now, maybe you're, you're gonna make 140, 150, 100, let's say 160 a year. And then they end up, you know, being millionaires in three to four years. How, how does that happen? 
I, I'm not even going to speculate. Okay, so anyway, I heard a good one the other day that they were voting back, you know, years ago, they were voting uh, on Amtrak. And if you don't know, Joe Biden used to take the Amtrak from where he lived to Washington every single day. So he'd ride the Amtrak because he was just a normal Joe, like everybody else. He's on. So they were voting on raising, you know, the Amtrak so that bailing them out is what they were doing. And all the Congress people said, yes, we want to vote for it because we want to make sure Joe Biden goes home at night every night. <laughs> oh, I, I died laughing. Any other questions? No, I'm open. Oh. Simple. What's your advice on first time buyers? First time buyers? Uh, it depends. Are you buying for yourself or an investor or investment? If you're if you're in California, do flipping. If you're out of if you want to go out of state for cash flow, then go out of state. Okay, you can't cash flow here, California, unless you do um, like I said, uh, Airbnb and Big Bear or Joshua Tree, any of those places, you can Airbnb and make money, uh, but not not around here, at all. The last month's speaker, uh, JD, he is um, a buy and hold and a flipper in, uh, in Texas. And he lives here in Irvine. And he told us he, he went out there and he spent a couple of months out there investigating the market, putting his team together. And he's got like, I don't know, I think like 15, 20 flips, something like that, that he's doing right now. And that was in a short period of time. It wasn't a long period of time, but he did his homework and he actually went out there. Uh, my lender called me the other day and I was talking to her and she says, Joe, we're investing in uh, Detroit. I go, whoa, Detroit, how's that working out? She goes, fantastic. She says, we're buying properties that are 30 and $40,000. We're rehabbing them for about 10, and then we're renting them out. And if you've never done loans before, the lenders won't loan you money unless it's 100,000 or above. She says, in the last year, we bought 26 properties. We take three or four of them and bunch them together to get a hundred or hundred and fifty thousand dollar loan, okay, and tie up all the properties with that loan. And we've basically the Burr method, we've taken all our money back out and we're positive cash flow on them. Okay. They're they're so successful now that the cities found out what they were doing, and sometimes that's kind of bad. In this case, it's good because they were uh, renting the homes out to Section 8, which is uh, low income. And the city said, well, God, this, this same group is renting out a lot of places. We like that, you know, because we have a bunch of people on Section 8, low income, and, you know, we want to find them housing. So they called her and they said, hey, we love what you're doing. How about if we give you the leads? How about if we give you the properties that we've taken over? Yeah. They called her and says, hey, we've got a bunch of properties that we've taken over that aren't in the best neighborhood, but if you're willing to stomach it, as long, I will give you the properties as long as you rent them to Section 8 housing. Hello, that's a niche. That's a really good niche. Okay, I don't want to go out there, but, you know, hey, sh her and her business partner are out there doing that. Okay. So my advice to you is, first of all, you need to get experience and training, okay, to make sure that you're making good decisions along the way. Once you feel comfortable with that, then go out. And especially if you're young, uh, JD had no problem getting on a plane, flying out there, spending two months. Um, I, I would hope my wife would miss me if I was gone that much, but maybe not. Maybe it'd be a good break or whatever, you know? Go go uh, investigate something else for two or three months, but um, life happens. It, like, if you're single, I'm telling you, you should be out there exploring all this stuff and trying to make money as quick as possible because life hits you in the face. That's either a girlfriend or a boyfriend, significant other that slows you down, that may not see it like you do, and then comes that other gift in life is children. And that really slows you down, okay? Because the women, they start to nest. Like, yeah, I don't want to go. 
uh, I like this house. Okay. My daughter, um, my son's the same thing, but mostly my daughter. I bought her during 2008. I bought all my kids a condo for 100,000. How could you not? So I bought them um, a, a condo. Uh, she sold that. She made like about $80,000. She was 24 at the time. She just graduated from college. Uh, she sold that, bought a townhouse. She sold that and bought a, a house at the courthouse steps. And um, each time, the third, the third, the third time uh, she got married, and now she has a two-year-old, two, uh, yeah, almost two and a half, but two-year-old. Uh, and then they just finished buying a fixer in Mission Viejo because her husband is the other member of my team that flips properties. Um, and so they, they, they do all that full time and they're, they're just rehabbing a house in Mission Viejo to move into. They purchased it for a million. Uh, they're probably gonna spend, they thought a hundred, but it's gonna turn out to be two. Um, but at the end of the day, it'll be worth 1.4. And they said that that's their forever home. That's where they're going to live. Okay. And they take, they take the two year old over there, you know, as the construction's going on, this is your room. And so every time he goes over, he goes, you know, let me show you my, my room, grandpa. I go, okay, go show me your room, you know? So, yeah. So if you're young, you need, you need, you literally, you need to start moving. Mm -hmm. So I had, a, I had a guest last year, we were uh, on Zoom because of COVID, like everybody else. And what this guy was doing, he was doing a lot of Airbnbs, but what he was doing is he was going to the apartment complex, okay? And he was saying, how much to rent this two bedroom? $2,000 a month, okay? I'm gonna rent this bedroom for $2,000 a month, but I wanna turn it into an Airbnb. Do you have a problem with that? Yeah, we kind of need the apartment rented, so we're going to take a chance on you, okay? So he rents it for $2,000 a month. He puts all the Airbnb furniture and everything, decorates it, and then he starts doing Airbnb, and he is very profitable. And what he would do is literally just go to the apartment complexes because the cities really can't regulate that because it's a private business that's doing it. It's apartment complex anyway, so what are they going to say, you know? So that's how he kind of got around that, um, you know, problem with either buying a condo because the association is not going to let you do it um, or uh, buying a house, then the city's not going to let you do it. Okay. Even in San Diego, they, they changed everything, all the regulations. They even, uh, I'm thinking about like drawing. So like one, one year you have a permit and then they're going to draw again, and you may not get it. So they were like complaining and stuff like that. So even in like a tourist town like San Diego, like there's like all kinds of things. Like and don't, don't think that these governments can't change the laws, because they can. Okay? Don't think that they can't, because they can and they will and they have. So you have to, you have to deal with whatever comes your way. Any other questions? Um, we've got this room for like literally, what time is it? Oh yeah, we got this room for another hour and 15 minutes so that you can network with uh, other folks here. So if there's no other, any other questions, no? Okay, well thank you for coming, I appreciate it. You have a happy holiday. Um, I sent out information to everybody. I opened up my flipping course and my wholesaling course online. So if you're interested in getting any of that type of training, just go online and, uh, and then sign into the course and listen to, to me and other people talk about it. Okay. That was sent in the meetup. Yeah. If you didn't get it, just send me an email. I'll send it to you. It's, it's really easy to remember. Get real estate trained .com. Okay. Is that easy to remember? Yeah, getrealestatetrain.com. Yeah. Okay. The other courses that are on there are for real estate agents, and uh, they're password protected uh, because 
it really doesn't apply to in investors. It's it's more about being a real estate agent and learning how to use you know your super key and things like that. It has nothing to do really with uh, investors. Okay, but the course the do the few courses I do have on there, the flipping 101 and wholesaling 101 I have on there. They're they're open and free. Huh? GetRealEstateTrained.com. Yeah. Okay. Anybody want a hundred thousand? You, you wow! How many have I given you? Oh. You you gave it away. Watch it head. 